Okay. All right. Well, I will introduce Andrew then. So, um, yes, welcome everybody to the RAX Network and to our uh, the first of, of many of our uh, lectures by stars in the field of uh, astrotheology, astrobiology, and those sorts of things. Today we've got uh, Reverend Dr. Andrew Davison, who's Starbridge, correct me if I get any of this wrong, Andrew, but Starbridge Associate Professor in Theology and Natural Science at the University of Cambridge. He's got a background in both science and theology, having a BA in chemistry with biochemistry and biophysics from Oxford, a DPhil in biochemistry also from Oxford, BA in theology and religious studies from Cambridge, and then a PhD in theology from Cambridge. I think you've also had various uh, centers and things and awards uh, that you might want to mention briefly at the beginning, Andrew, um, but hopefully that will do for a, a brief introduction. So um, you're going to be talking about, uh, uh, well, I don't know, let's, I'll hand over to you, Andrew, over thank, to you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to be talking about Christian theology, which is my area of uh, speciality, and I'm going to be taking a particular aspect of it that I think has not been uh, given the attention that it perhaps deserves in relation to astrobiology, which is eschatology or the theology of the last things and the life of the world to come. So I hardly need, I think, to explain why it's worth thinking about astrobiology, about life elsewhere in the universe, to this um, distinguished group of people and this network which is doing so much to draw attention to the importance of this topic. Right the way through the 20th century, although there was a great deal of writing about life elsewhere in the universe, as there had been in centuries before, we didn't know whether there were any other potentially habitable planets. And all that changed in 1995, uh, when one of my colleagues here, amongst others, Didier, Didier Kahlo, uh, now Professor of Astrophysics, discovered for the first time a planet around another star and um, the first exoplanet. And I think even for those people who were expecting that there would be planets around other stars, the ubiquity of these things and just yeah, just how many of them there are uh, has even taken such people by surprise. And we're, uh, what, 20 or so, um, 25 years on from that, uh, we have this enormous tally of planets around other stars. And with the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope just at the end of last year, the prospect of many more being discovered. And these numbers really provoke us to think about life elsewhere in the universe from all of our various different perspectives, and uh, in my case, from that of Christian theology. Uh, I can report that this has been a topic of conversation pretty much continuously since about 1450. That's the earliest uh, treatment that I can find. But they're often very, very short. Um, we're almost at uh, the advantage that our forebears have found this topic unthreatening. They've generally not been worried about the prospect of life elsewhere in the universe, and they've noted it and moved on. And that means that we have uh, history studied with these little discussions, often from quite significant theologians, but they haven't really dug deep. And so I had the good fortune to be in uh, Princeton about five years ago, with a, a year to think about this, and ever since I've been writing a book which will be coming out in October to be called uh, Astrobiology and Christian Doctrine. What a boring name, but there we are, Astro Theology, uh, Astro uh, Astrobiology and Christian Doctrine. Um, and I, I can report from Cambridge with in enthusiasm that there is great interest in um, studying the prospect of life elsewhere in the universe uh, and doing so in a very joined up and interdisciplinary sort of way. So you may have seen that we just were the recipients of a 10 million pound grant from the Leverhulme Trust for a center on uh, studying the origins of life uh, in the universe. And what has particularly pleased me about that is the way in which the arts and humanities, philosophy, literature, theology, uh, has been really integrated into that vision since the beginning. And uh, so we're clearly at a very exciting time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which the prospect of life elsewhere in the universe throws up some challenges uh, for Christian doctrines of eschatology, which we might think um, alongside creation is the doctrine that really can take everything in its stride because just about, just as creation already refers to absolutely everything, whatever out there is out there, the, the Christian theologian will see them as created. In a similar sort of way, the doctrine of eschatology, the last things, has this similar capacity to gather all things together. Nothing would be spared, it would be outside the remit um, of eschatology. 
Um, and yet, historically, astrology has not been considered in relation to astrobiology as widely or as deeply as we might expect. And for those uh, thinkers where it has been in view, it's interesting how varied the responses are. So on the one hand, we have an extraordinary text, uh, Alice Maynell's poem, Christ in the Universe, which I have reproduced for you from the early 20th century, which is entirely conceived as a work of eschatology imagining races from all around the cosmos in the life of the world to come, comparing notes about their experience uh, of God's ways with them, and particularly multiple incarnations, one of the earliest really positive endorsements of the idea of many incarnations. And yet um, another figure, Brian Hevelthwaite, writing I think at the very end of the 20th century, um, his great argument against multiple incarnations is that he doesn't think it makes sense for them to meet in the life of the world to come. So one writer endorsing this, grasping it enthusiastically, one um, saying that it's the, the, the great argument against the idea of multiple incarnations. And I think that's a really wonderful poem. And I, uh, the title of this uh, talk has been um, taken from it and I do commend it to you. So I want to get at two aspects of thinking about uh, this, uh, this idea of eschatology, both the, the way which Christians have conceived of the final state, and the way in which Christians have conceived about its arrival in time. Those are the two halves of my uh, talk. And I think it's particularly with the second that we come across some challenges. Generally speaking, I think there's very little in the prospect of life elsewhere in the universe that's going to really cause Christian theology to have to um, think things through radically, but perhaps with eschatology, we have an example. So I want to be a little bit reticent in thinking about the, the final state, the life of the world to come, um, St Paul says, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has the human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And there is a good, there is good reason, I think, for being reticent and not speculating too much about what there is uh, to come. And in fact, um, that will be my general, um, that will be my general touchstone, as it were. But I think that uh, all the way through consideration of life elsewhere in the universe as a theological topic, we find that we are encouraged to see things from new angles. And even if we never discovered any life elsewhere in the universe, we would return to our own situation with our thinking enriched. Um, it's a theme that comes up in poetry and literature across the 20th century. It's in one of uh, T.S. Eliot's four quartets, for instance, the idea that you go on a journey and you come back to your place and you recognize it uh, uh, for the first time you, um, you find new depth there. So I think there are ways in which thinking about life elsewhere in the universe helps us to understand our terrestrial theology, even if we're never actually um, presented with um, any evidence of life elsewhere in the universe. And one good example here, I think, is the way in which vision has been so central to the Christian account of what the life of the world comes uh, looks like with the idea of the beatific vision, but the happy making vision uh, of God, which is at the centre of so many uh, traditions, especially Western and, uh, and Catholic ones. Well, among, uh, among the, the useful challenges here, I think, is the observation that different forms of life would not necessarily flourish in the same uh, medium or environmental setting, and in particular would not therefore have the same senses. So approaches to eschatology that place the emphasis on the vision of God may wish to um, expand their sense of what it means to encounter God in the life of the world to come. A range of creatures from across the cosmos would likely embody a range of senses used to apprehend the world around them. And uh, there might be convergence amongst that. I mean, wherever there's things to be seen, there may be uh, sight, wherever there's light, um, wherever there are oscillations in the air, where there may be convergence to hearing, touch, and so on. And yet we can also imagine that we don't even need to go beyond the earth to realize that there are other ways of sensing, um, sort of those ways that, are, for instance, that fish uh, and sharks, um, dolphins and bats and so on, um, have, have modes of sensation beyond, um, beyond the, those that we understand with the echolocation or um, the way in which, or electro uh, location, for instance. So I think we're, or, we're immediately uh, challenged to recognize that in talk of the beatific vision, that vision of God said to, be the ultimate fulfillment of the human being, um, that there would be other modalities beyond sight. 
And if species evolved in the dark, for instance, they would not have sight at all. Um, I don't think we have any need here to upend the core idea of the beatific vision, but it reminds us that the language of vision here is an analogy, uh, a metaphor, um, and uh, the whole being described in terms of the part. Theologians have singled out sight as the most elevated of the senses quite often. Augustine stands as a good example of that, for instance. Um, and yet they have also stressed that whatever we mean by the beatific vision, it transcends the use of the eye or any corporeal organ, even of the resurrected body. Aquinas quotes Augustine here, no one has ever seen God either in this life as he is or in the life that is in the future as a visible thing seen by corporeal vision. Indeed, Aquinas thought that it is impossible to, for God to be seen by the sense of sight or by any other sense or by any other faculty belonging to our human capacity to sense. God can not be seen by sense or imagination, but only by the intellect. So I think we have a really good example here about how astrobiology uh, forces us to reconsider some of our doctrines or come at them from new angles. And uh, we have the sense that uh, to, to apprehend God in the life of the world to come, uh, where to talk about sight is only an analogy or perhaps thinking about the part, uh, you know, whole in terms of the part. Um, and maybe it uh, provokes us to think about the beatific vision as also being about uh, smelling God, uh, tasting God, uh, touching God, and so on. Um, so a good example, I think, of how we are um, provoked um, from uh, the recognition that there might be other creatures out there, bodily creatures, uh, different from ourselves, but with an eternal destiny. Um, I've mentioned uh, already Alice Maynell's poem, and I think one of the challenges for eschatology uh, is, in fact, uh, always, is to think about what it means for different creatures to have some kind of community themselves in the life of the world to come. So um, it's quite easy for everything to just be subsumed into the vision and relation to God. And you find theologians who are otherwise quite communitarian in their outlook, having struggling, having difficulty in really accounting for how the relationship between, between one creature uh, in the life of the world to come and another really matters. And as I say, I think we should generally uh, get away from speculating too much about the life of the world to come. Um, but I can't help but note that if we're going to take the resurrection of the body seriously, then we're immediately faced with some challenges about how different sorts of creatures can, can relate to one another and even be in the same sort of place. And I mentioned Alice Maynell's uh, poem. There is actually another rather wonderful, rather um, rather cruel poem, um, a fun poking uh, uh, by Rupert Brooke called Heaven. And I put that on the handout. And um, it's from that period when uh, even people who wanted to poke fun uh, at Christianity and perhaps had no great uh, affinity with it uh, knew the scriptures very well. And he imagines the life of the world to come from the perspective of a fish. Um, and he plays on various passages uh, in the New Testament. Um, for instance, that there is a worm that does not die. Well, in the, in the Gospels, that's considered to be a bad thing for the human beings, but for the fish, the idea of a worm that does not die uh, is considered as a, a great delicacy. Um, and a very clever uh, switching round of a passage from the end of Revelation, where um, there it said, and there will be no more sea. The sea standing in this uh, Jewish imagination as a, a symbol of chaos, and that which is finally overcome. Of course, that's bad news for a fish. And so uh, Rupert Brooke has the fish saying, there will be no more land, say fish. And um, although it's not a poem of any great theological sophistication, I think it does raise this rather interesting idea of how different sorts of creatures, if we take their bodiliness seriously, um, can uh, really coexist with one another. But as I say, I'm generally going to um, shy away from being too too uh, speculative in thinking about uh, eschatology. But in his poem, and especially in those final lines, Brooke crystallizes a problem for Christian theologians thinking eschatologically about different forms of life elsewhere in the universe. In as much as what makes for life in each case is different and indeed incompatible, how can that be realized simultaneously? The theologian's best response perhaps is one of caution and antagonism as to eschatological detail. 
So I'm basically working through the themes that I cover in the two chapters on eschatology in the book. And I'm going to pass over uh, rather quickly the idea of the ascension and what's sometimes called the doctrine of the session, so that the sitting down of Christ at the right hand of the Father. Of course, especially if one comes to the conclusion that there are many incarnations, then it might seem that it raises uh, questions about how there can be many at the right hand of the Father. And in any case, it does raise this, it uh, maps onto that question of how a multiplicity of different things can coexist in the life of the world to come. And all I would point to there is that the tradition is more sophisticated here than we might give it credit for. And you find, I've, I've reproduced in the handout, um, a passage of Luther, where he examines the idea that uh, sitting at the right hand of the Father, he says, is not a specific place in which a body must or may be, such as on a golden throne, but the right hand of the Father is the almighty power of God, which at one and the same time can be nowhere and yet must be everywhere. So I'm going to pass over the ascension and the session, but we'll find that there's a little bit more in the tradition that we can do work with. Um, others before myself have commented on the way in which um, the eschatological role of some of the saints uh, might be uh, pr provoked, uh, provoked to think about them differently in terms uh, of uh, life around the universe. So we might think about the tradition found, I think, more in Roman Catholicism than perhaps in Orthodoxy or Anglicanism, and certainly than in Protestant traditions, of Mary as the Queen of Heaven, um, and similarly of St. Peter as like, Heaven's Gatekeeper. And I suppose this is perhaps a little bit playful, but um, you know, for some people, and I would be among them, the, the hagiographical dimension is a really important part um, of, of the Christian faith. And here, I think the, um, the way forward is to say that these saints would fulfill their role with respect to the particular communities that they belong to. Um, and uh, after all, instead of St. Peter, you know, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven, what you bind, um, what you loose on earth is loose in heaven, we just need to take earth there to be, um, to be our planet, our story, our community. And I think with, um, with the title of Mary as Our Lady, we have a, actually a particularly nice way into this. She's Our Lady, she is the one who made answer to all creation as a human being to the redeeming will of God, to, to quote their um, uh, an orthodox prayer. She's Our Lady, and already I think we see this reflected within the Christian tradition. Now, I grew up in East Yorkshire, just a few miles away from Beverley. There's a, a saint buried there, St John of Beverley, if he wasn't uh, turfed out at the Reformation. He's our local lad made good, and you know we have a very strong sense, those of us who are going for such things, uh, of, uh, of St John being the, the local guy that we're particularly attached to. And just up the road in Bridlington, there's another St John, St John of Bridlington. Or if I was a Dominican, then we would say that the father in the faith was St Dominic. If I was a Benedictine, it would be St Benedict. There's already, I think, within the Christian tradition, plenty of room saying that um, a figure doesn't have to be of absolutely universal significance to have great significance for those gathered into that community. And I think we could say the same uh, for Mary and for um, St Peter, for instance. So there are all sorts of themes that are raised for us about the state of the life of the world to come, how different things can relate to one another, um, and in the idea of the vision of God about the way in which we might want to expand beyond our sense uh, of sight, for instance, and various questions about um, the roles of the saints and so on. But I think that what's really provocative in eschatology, for eschatology, for, for, uh, from uh, the idea of life also in the universe, is not so much the state of the life of the world to come, but the way in which it arrives. Um, so there is already within Christianity a tension between a sort of uh, deferred and a realized eschatology. So there will be traditions that want to place the emphasis on the idea that, um, as Maritain says, Jacques Maritain, uh, what comes after time is prepared in time. The idea that you roll up your sleeves and you get on with uh, bringing about the, uh, the kingdom of God now. Um, and there are other traditions that, that talk much more about apocalypse and the, the, uh, the eruptive um, inbreaking of God. Um, I remember a child, someone saying in a sermon, uh, using language that will be familiar from uh, those who uh, go to uh, pubs in the UK, you know, it's, the, it's when God cries, time, gentlemen, please, um, uh, as it used to be said, uh, which was just before last orders. This is the eschatology of the last trumpet. And, and you will find uh, theologies that kind of collapse into one or the other. There'll be some certainly that have no interest in trying to realize 
um, a more just society now because it's just all referred to the deferred to the future and there'll be some that have uh, no sense of a, of a coming cataclysm and it's all about what you do now but generally speaking Christian theology has has trod a line of combining both of the, those things. Now um, I'm speaking from a relatively um, I suppose conservative vision of Christianity, traditional vision of Christianity. I think it's um, probably interesting to see what astrobiology means for theology at its most traditional rather than theology at its um, perhaps uh, more um, revisionary from the middle of the 20th century. You know, see, see if that which is uh, seemingly least pliant is, is actually able to, uh, to withstand these, uh, these challenges, which I think generally it is. Um, so that's the, that's the sort of perspective I'm going to be um, speaking out of. And um, I would say that if, as has been the case, Christianity has generally thought of there being one incarnation, uh, it's generally therefore also thought that the, the cessation of all things, the last trumpet and so on, the second coming, would be a moment in human history. That's how it's depicted um, in the New Testament. Um, could be no other way, I think, really. It's exactly what we would expect. But especially if you embrace the idea of multiple incarnations, if you think that wherever there is sentient life, or in some places where there's sentient life, um, God has dealt with it with the same kind of intimacy as uh, on earth and come among us, uh, come among them uh, in their own nature, then I think it becomes much more difficult to imagine that the end of the whole cosmos is a moment in human history. I mean, after all, um, there may well have been civilizations that have come and gone a billion years ago. So, um, uh, you know, if, if, if we are one amongst many with parity, then I think it becomes more difficult to imagine that the end of all things comes in human history. Now, what, how do we respond to that? Well, um, one, uh, one thought that comes to mind um, is that Christianity has already had to deal with something a bit like this, uh, with the idea of the delayed parousia. So it was quite popular in New Testament studies, perhaps a little bit less so nowadays, or at least it's being challenged, to imagine that one of the great challenges that the early church went through was expecting Jesus to come back you know, in their lifetime and that not happening. Now, some of my colleagues here in Cambridge New Testament scholars uh, have, have questioned that, but in a way it doesn't really even matter whether that was the crisis that the early church went through through because it's a crisis that people have thought that the early church went through and therefore they've written a great deal about it. So that material in itself is all about um, things not happening uh, in quite the way that you expected um, and you know and it not being all about you. So it was expected to be during one's own lifetime and that didn't happen, uh, the lifetime of those around you and there was some, uh, there was some rethinking to be done. Uh, but I would also say that the existential tradition, which is not one particularly that I've you know, particularly drawn from, uh, has quite a lot to offer here. I think about people like uh, John Macquarie, for instance. Um, and so there's that big sense, um, I suppose, from um, uh, Bultmann onwards and uh, influence of Kierkegaard, Heidegger, um, that the, the Christian message was all about um, being addressed by God in this moment and having to make a response. Uh, and especially in its more liberal forms, which I mean, I think uh, John Macquarie would probably would be representative of this. It really shifted the emphasis away from the idea of some kind of future tumult uh, to the idea that uh, eschatology was all about the appearance of the end in the form of the Christian message, uh, confronting each person. Um, and uh, that, that I think can be quite uh, useful. So. I, I don't want to make that the whole of the eschatological story, but if partly uh, that is what it's about, then it can retain its force, even if we were no longer to think necessarily that the, the wrapping up of all things came during uh, human history. So I have still a, a theological commitment to the, to the idea that the end of all things is not just business as usual. Um, it's not just a big crunch or heat death or just science going about its so I think it's um, pretty integral to the theological vision that the end of all things is to be understood, as I think I used that word already, as something eruptive or interruptive. So one could still think that the end of the whole cosmos would come in that way at some stage without thinking that that necessarily happens, has to be in the span of the 
of the human race, just as one um, already has to juggle the idea that this, this would come, but it didn't necessarily have to come during one's own lifetime. Um, and I think you could take from existential tradition, a tradition of existential theology, that, that what matters is the um, response. I mean, this, this can be uh, perhaps not have enough of grace to it, but certainly that part of what one one's talking about is the way in which this faces uh, each person and calls forth for some, calls for some kind of um, response. Um, and uh, if you want a rather nice example of the way in which these things uh, can be woven together, um, there is a marvellous cantata by Bach, the um, Actus Tragicus, uh, cantata number 106, where um, in the second movement, the choir meditates on death uh, and sings, it is the old covenant, man, you must die, while a soprano soloist turns simultaneously to the second coming, singing, yes, come, Lord Jesus, you come. Uh, nice uh, holding together of the idea that already in the Christian tradition, the idea of coming face to face with God through a kind of interruptive end of things is, is seen alongside the idea for most people that that is going to uh, happen through death. And I uh, point in the, in the handout to a passage from um, one or two Peter, I'm just trying to find it here, um, which uh, might seem the most uh, cataclysmic uh, and interruptive of, uh, of all passages. Here we are from 2 Peter 3. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Absolutely that kind of last trumpet kind of eschatology. But then the author goes on, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? So even in that apocalyptic passage, it turns in this somewhat existentialist sense to saying it's not just about future events. It's about the question that's posed to you. What then uh, sort of response, what kind of life uh, will you uh, will you lead? Um, so it seems to me uh, that I'm coming towards my conclusion that generally speaking, uh, Christian theology can take the idea of life elsewhere in the universe in its stride. I don't think there's much in the doctrine of creation that's going to be perturbed. Um, and for a Thomist like me, in fact, the idea of multiplicity is already pretty woven into um, uh, what creation is about. Um, Christology faces all sorts of interesting provocations, but um, I think one can both say that one incarnation is enough for the whole cosmos and think that it might be appropriate for or fit, particularly fitting uh, for there to be many. So I've worked the way uh, in this book that's coming out through lots of different topics in Christian theology and generally speaking I've not thought that there uh, was much that's, that, that called for any sort of much rewriting. Um, but in this idea of when the end comes I think that there, there really is something that Christianity may need to reconceive at least in its most uh, traditional forms and I don't think we've ever really I can't think of of authors really that have um that have well as, as, as a tradition as a whole I don't think we we've done the work of thinking about what it would mean to imagine that there could be a post-human history for the earth um uh, and for the cosmos so I think that is quite a uh, a, sig a significant challenge to us um probably has environmental consequences as well uh, in as much as there is a tendency, I think, in some traditions to think that it doesn't really matter what we do to the earth because it's all going to be dissolved and rolled up and, you know, any minute with the second coming. But if one has to uh, really entertain the possibility uh, that um, plenty of civilizations have been and gone and plenty others after us might, might come and go, then, then suddenly what we do, I mean, I think this is true anyway, but what we do with the earth uh, becomes all the more um, uh, all the more significant and you know it, it becomes quite conceivable to think that we could um, we could wipe ourselves out because uh, perhaps that has uh, has happened already um, elsewhere. I fear that those Christian traditions that are most in need of that um, cajoled take the, the care of the earth uh, more seriously because it really is in our hands are likely to be those that are uh, least um, likely to be engaged with questions of astrobiology and, and so on. So I, um, I have just a one last area in thinking about, one last aspect to talk about in terms of this question of the, uh, the coming of the end, which is to do with the resurrection. 
um, and it's been integral to Christian theology, traditionally speaking, to see the resurrection of Christ as the inauguration of the, uh, the beginning of the recreation of all things. So it's a sort of down payment, the first fruits, the beginning of a transformation that will eventually um, overtake all things and renew all things. And I think there's a, um, a disjunction or something new to be considered here if we do think about life elsewhere in the universe, especially if we think, perhaps only if we think, that it has been uh, touched by incarnations of its own. Um, so the disjunction here would come from seeing the resurrection of Christ as the dawn of a new creation, which uh, we would think you know, bears upon the cosmos as a whole, and then thinking that perhaps that has happened um, in many different places. Not for nothing is the resurrection of the dead compared to the radical newness of creation and recreation. Easter day in the Christian tradition is counted as the eighth day, the, the first day of the creation of the, of the world. Um, and yet, um, if we think about that happening in, uh, in many different places, how do we hold that together? How can there be many inaugurations and first fruits and, and beginnings uh, of the restoration of all things? Well, the only author I know to have addressed this question directly is a Frenchman called Jacques Arnaud. And while his account is consistent, it strikes me as rather deflationary in terms of the significance that it accords to the resurrection of Christ. So for him, multiple resurrections offer no particular difficulties because um, he sees the resurrection of Christ and presumably those others as an indication rather than a cause, as a sign of something more ultimate. He says for him, the meaning of the resurrection is that God did not abandon his Messiah, so he will not abandon his creation. Um, but it has no sort of causal inaugurative uh, effect. Uh, and this uh, connection tends in my view to rob the resurrection of its radical newness. Um, it might perhaps be a sort of manifestation, a new manifestation, but it would not be the manifestation of something new. Uh, moreover, and crucially, there is no sense in Arno that the resurrection of Christ is the cause of the remake, remaking of all things. Um, and uh, I'll leave you to, uh, so it's a uh, Tourbans dans l'univers is the book. Um, it's around page 238. Um, so Arno will write that the resurrection is not a consequence of the incarnation, nor is the incarnation a prior condition for the resurrection. For Arno, the appearance of resurrection as a, is, a, is a general principle, um, which may be associated as it happens with the resurrection of the incarnate son, um, at least in our own story, but the incarnation is neither its cause or its necessary condition. And that feels to me quite different from the traditional um, Christian view. Well, I, in most things, I turn to see what Aquinas has got to say about these things. Uh, and it's striking that he charts a sort of middle way. Um, on the one hand, um, he has a kind of reverence for the power and freedom of God. So he, a bit like Arno, cautions us not to link um, resurrection of, uh, of the universe uh, necessarily with the resurrection of Christ or even with the incarnation. Um, but um, he, he thinks that even if, God could have brought about the renewal of all things uh, outside of the resurrection of Christ. Nonetheless, it was supremely fitting that God should have done so. And on this uh, question of whether the resurrection of Christ is causative of the renewal of all things, again, he, he charts a sort of middle way, a kind of yes, no, um, both and sort of, both sort of way. The sense of sign or manifestation, that's the whole story for our no is strongly present, um, but he goes beyond it into causal territory saying that Christ rose also in order to complete the work of salvation, that he might deliver us from evil and so on. Um, he talks about Christ as the beginning and exemplar of the life of the world to come, which are words that have quite causative um, uh, effect for him. He talks about the resurrection as being that through which our salvation was wrought. So um, I do think we then have to, if we're not going to just uh, dismiss the resurrection of Christ as being some kind of manifestation of a more general principle, we are raised, uh, we are left with the question of what, um, what to do with the idea that there might be many uh, resurrections potentially. Um, and here, I think I would want to say uh, that this is, you know, a work in, in progress. I'd be interested to see what other people have got to uh, say about it. Um, but uh, maybe we just take it back to that idea of, um, 
of there being individual communities, individual civilizations, individual um, uh, individuals joined together by species, and that it's appropriate that, um, that for each of those communities, for each of those places, for each of those species, there should be a, an eruptive uh, beginning of the renewal of all things uh, through the resurrection. And in general, I would say that there's good reason for thinking that the, the theological reasons for thinking that the works of God are characterized by a kind of superfluity rather than by a bare necessity. So um, maybe we shouldn't be that surprised if we're having to deal with, um, uh, with more than what was absolutely strictly uh, necessary. A barren hillside might be restored with the sprouting of a single seed left to multiply over time, but it would not be unfitting to achieve it by scattering the seed of many species in abundance. So um, I hope that's given some food for thought. I wanted to take a topic that has not really been discussed very much from a theological perspective in relation to life elsewhere in the universe, uh, namely eschatology, and just show through that you know, one topic um, how many different questions are raised for us. Uh, and I divided it between the, the, the final state, the nature of the final state, uh, where I think there are some interesting provocations, but nothing that's particularly um, necessarily disjunctive, uh, and the question of the, the manner or timing of the arrival, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that eruptive arrival or, or drawing together of all things. And there, I think, um, it may seem like the perfectly most obvious thing in the world, perhaps to people outside the Christian tradition, but those um, who have been formed by a historical, uh, it's particularly historically dominant sense, I think will be very attached to the idea that one is to expect the end of all things as a moment in human history. And I think especially if we think of many incarnations, God dealing with many uh, different places uh, equally intimately as us, that becomes uh, quite difficult to hold. And then I think we need to turn back to our tradition. It's about holding together the second coming with death, holding together um, that, uh, drawing upon that idea of, um, of the existentialist tradition um, and saying, yes, we, we, the whole point is the Advent message of being ready at any moment, uh, even recognizing though that uh, it might not come in one's own lifetime and extending that to say, well, maybe it might not come uh, in the lifetime of the human species either. So there, I'm gonna end with that. Uh, it's a bit of a trawl through some of the aspects of eschatology that I think um, are um, challenged or at least are given um, good grit, uh, grit for the oyster uh, by thinking about eschatological topics and ex exobiological topics. Thank you for that, Andrew. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, no, and, and perfectly on time, so we can have some questions now. Shall we, if, if everybody's happy, either physically raise your hand in front of the screen, or if you know how to use the reactions button, you can raise your hand on there, and I'll then sort of hand over to you to ask your question. Shall we do it like that? Sounds good. Okay, so, uh, I mean, I've got some questions, but I won't go first. Um, any questions? I've tapped. Oh, yeah. Okay, Robert, over to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I thought that was really interesting. And I thought it was very, um, provoked some thoughts which I'd already, I'd already had brought to the, to the surface of my mind. Um, the first thing was, I think you're quite right to say that, um, that um, the, um, the end of the world, the last Trump, would, as it were, be a singularity. And it also struck me that there are a number of singularities. One of the other singularities is, of course, the creation of the universe. And um, the creation of the universe, the um, um, creation of life, and indeed of rational human beings. Um, and I... We would also, th I, I thought that was, that, that, was, that was important, but I also thought too that um, I wondered if you could um, think of the, um, um, uh, think in terms of the, uh, of, 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 a, of a Christian promise of a new heaven and a new earth. And I thought that could well be put, well seemed to fit with, fit um, in my mind with um, Penrose's idea of a serial universe. So that, as it were, the, the new heaven and the new and the new earth is a new is a new universe, um, which which works according to different rules, 
and in which we can enjoy uh, something I'm really looking forward to, um, a resurrection body. Um, but thank you very much. Those were just a few thoughts. Um, I've got more, but I think it's not my, it's not fair for me to go on. <laughs> but thank you very much. It's really interesting. Well, you're certainly right to draw attention to the resurrection of the body as being absolutely central to the Christian belief on, on this front, because I think without that, um, much that I've talked about goes away. Uh, there have been occasionally more idealist approaches to eschatology. I think Keith Ward sometimes writes in this sort of way, this, this universe being a kind of soul factory and the souls uh, drift off. And, I, and in that case, um, we don't face some of the questions that I've thought about here. Um, one of the earliest, perhaps the earliest example I know of, of someone thinking about the prospect of more than one incarnation comes in exactly this kind of serial universe situation. It's in origin. Uh, where he he knows that there are some traditions that have thought about the world as being an endless cycle, um, sort of Nietzschean sort of way, uh, and and he talks about well he, he denies that, and in particular he denies that there's more than one incarnation because there's this uh, sequence. And I know Penrose is thinking about a different sort of world, but I, one of the things that I found in in writing about um, writing about this is that um, what what people have got in mind is quite often quite quite different. So um, yes, Origen uh, rules out the possibility of more than one incarnation because he's thinking about this kind of cyclical model of time. It doesn't necessarily mean that that plays out uh, if one's thinking about the spatial distribution as we are, but uh, I'll, I'll draw that, that point to a close there and maybe there's a, another question. Well, I, I will jump in with a a question. Maybe I uh, missed it. Maybe you did. Maybe you did e e explain it. But given there's uh, this way of reading uh, this idea of the sort of wrapping up of all things, the the apocalypse in in a more personal, symbolic kind of way. Um, I. I I don't see why there seem to be some options that perhaps seem to be ruled out a bit a bit too quickly. So, like first of all, why uh, couldn't there be lots of local apocalypses where God bursts in onto the scene, but just here, mm -hmm. and that's one option. But then, kind of, kind of as a tag on to that, or as an alternative to that, maybe yeah, maybe each species comes. We have our time. We have our incarnation, and then we feature out and die when our sun undergoes a heat death or something uh, but if 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 we don't if given it's you you're happy with the possibility that there might have been a species that's come and gone through natural means but that's okay they'll still be involved in the world to come however that's understood w why shouldn't god just let the universe kind of run out and do its heat death why does there need to be a big wrapping up of all events why can't he just let it sort of peter out and then build the new heavens and a new earth <laughs> in another dimension, so to speak. Yes, well, of course, uh, this is an example of where the Christian theology could quite easily make some accommodations. It, it could have necessarily, I mean, just as, it's actually exactly the same question, I think, or maps onto the, the question of, of whether there could be a, whether the universe has eternally existed. Um, uh, and there's a wonderful snapshot, we get a wonderful snapshot in the middle to late 13th century of pretty much every view on uh, is, is every perspective is on view. So Seizure of Brabant says, well, the universe must be finite in age because Aristotle says so. Uh, and Bonaventure says, sorry, it must be infinite in age. Sorry, it must be eternal in age because uh, Aristotle says so. And, and uh, Bonaventure says it must be finite in age because the, the Bible says uh, that it is. Uh, and Aquinas takes this middle position where he says, uh, well, there's nothing intrinsically stupid about the idea of a universe that's always existed. It still thinks it would need a creator still couldn't give an account for why it existed rather than not and so on. But as it happens, he thinks we know that the universe is a finite age. And I think one could just turn that around and say, similarly, there's nothing about uh, a universe that uh, exists forever into the future that is fundamentally unreconcilable. It's just that I do think this sense of eruption, interruption is very, um, is very significant. I don't want to make, um, uh, that abs absolutely necessary, but I think it, it would be a lurch for the Christian tradition uh, to let that go. I suppose there are questions about, you know, if there is a heat death, um, does one really um, uh, just, <laughs> is that just sustained for, 
for forever and ever and ever into its sort of just uh, fizzled out uh, nothingness. Um, I think actually for me, the, the reason that that cessation uh, matters is because it allows for a, a greater sense of continuity between this life and the life of the world to come. So that although all things are consumed, out of that, the life of the world, the, the new world is made. So just as there's this idea, and it's probably worked out particularly through the body. So, um, you know, and, and there are obviously some rather crude things that are written about this, not very sophisticated, but the, the core idea that the, the Christian hope is the resurrection of the body, and that the body that you lay into the ground, obviously the matter is dispersed, you know, all this sort of this sort of thing, and it gets more complicated, but there's still the idea that the, that the body is raised, um, and that matter is transfigured. And I think that if we just have this world going on forever, and then a kind of parallel world is created, it doesn't take seriously the um, grace doesn't destroy nature but perfects it. Glory doesn't abolish uh, nature but gl glorifies and redeems that that which is there. So I I think probably if I'm thinking out loud now, um, the kind of crux on which the idea of a kind of rolling of all things up uh, is where it matters is precisely because that then isn't just erased and thrown away, but it's made new. Um, and obviously one could reconcile that with a kind of different parallel world but it wouldn't have that sense I think of continuity and transformation. As for the idea of kind of local apocalypses I did write a little bit about this in the book and then in the end I decided that I was just so little an expert on um, millennialism and forms of apocalypses that I, that I took it out because I thought I just wouldn't um, really be able to speak with enough uh, authority but certainly um, as I understand it very millennial views of eschatology with a, a, a thousand year reign uh, it's all very concrete, it's about new forms of government, and uh, I suppose that could take uh, in its stride the idea of, um, of kind of local, local ends or local transfigurations. Uh, I think one thing I'd say in response to that is the traditions that are most invested in that, probably the ones that are going to be least interested in taking their bearings from what science might have to say, uh, and also that I think that there is something about the transformation of the whole cosmos uh, which is represented in that conflagration and rising of new beginnings from it uh, which just I think is much more difficult to express if we're thinking about local ends it's not it doesn't quite have that kind of cosmic transformatory um, destruction and resurrection of all things uh, to it which seems to me particularly in the 20th century has come back quite front and center into eschatology. Yeah, 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 no, no, that, that, yeah, you're not ruling it out per se, but it, it ties up loose ends and has a sort of fittingness to it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Chris. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, oh, thank you very much, Andrew, you're very stimulating, I, I love that. I think Margaret and I, and maybe she'd like to join in if she unmutes, um, would like to take a little bit of issue with Thomas's idea of the, uh, uh, the you know, the vision, beatific vision of God. And what our problem is, I suppose, is really Robert Brooks' fisheye view, uh, as well as, um, you know, that quotation, I think, from Corinthians of uh, St. Paul, I think uh, maybe even Thomas's imagination is a little limited and particularly didn't take seriously the fact of nature being transformed and perfected by grace. Our nature includes a lot more than the intellectual. So what about all that stuff and mm. the vision of God? Well, I think that I'm up to a point I'm pointing to something that's already present and that I'm uh, I'm saying although he uses this language of vision he is um, talking about um, a communion between the creature and God that transcends any any particular faculty um, but the danger I think is is I've written about this elsewhere it doesn't seem to take for instance the body seriously yeah. enough so it's not clear really why you would need to have a resurrection. Um, and in fact, the, tr the Franciscan tradition generally was much more upfront yeah. about that. 
and said, well, yeah, frankly, you don't. Um, I know Thomas is much more, you know, he's, he belongs to an order that was founded to combat the Albigensians. He has an he has a uh, investment uh, in materiality, but he, I don't think he can quite follow it through. And one of the ways in which this shows itself, I think, is in sociality. So there is a there is a quite an article in a question about whether um, friendship really has a part to play in the life of the world to come. And I don't think it's very convincing. I don't think. Our, our, um, um, Augustine does a particularly uh, good job of it either. So there's rather a nice um, article by um, the Roman Catholic ethicist Grise, in which he talks about the importance of um, of relationship in the life of the world to come. So I think you're you're completely right. And some of the work perhaps that's being done by, for instance, my colleague here in Cambridge, Simeon Zahl, on affect and the idea that it isn't just all about ideas and propositions, uh, you know, human human life and uh, and theology would also feed into that. So. Um, I like to find some things occasionally where I can uh, disagree with Aquinas, and I think you've put your finger on on where there's more work to be done, yeah. which is what you would want. Thanks, Margaret, for a little discussion on that. <laughs> the side. Yeah. Thank you. Too. Definitely, I agree. It's it's a broader thing, and and certainly, you know, obviously, I, I love Alice uh, Reynolds' sort of vision that broadening <clears throat> which comes with that. Uh, which was basically introduced to me by um, Arthur Peacock. I don't know how many of you knew Arthur Peacock, but uh, a wonderful, uh, he was not restricted, let's say, and he had a wonderful mind. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Margaret, over to, uh, over to you. Andrew, that was fa fantastic, super fantastic. It's very thought provoking. Um, I'm an American, as you can tell, but I do have a question that really wasn't Chris, the one Chris is at. Chris and I were sending each other text messages during your talk. So, you know, there was a third conversation going on. But anyway, uh, the one I'd like you to say a little bit more about, if you would, is this notion of um, successive civilizations, you know, the rise and fall of different peoples. Uh, and you said that leads to the importance of what we do with the earth, that others will use it after us. I really liked that idea. Uh, I, I think you could expand it and, and make it a kind of a, a little bit deeper than that even. But anyway, do you have anything else to say about that? Well, I've heard some, I think, quite convincing um expositions of, of various films that have come out recently that are about interplanetary civilizations, uh, sometimes quite explicitly as being uh, responding to our fears about climate devastation. Right. So there was, what was, a, what was one called? Um, had Matthew McConaughey in it, that's his name. Um, oh, I can't remember, but that's, I th that, that was said more explicitly in terms of uh, environmental degradation. And of course, you know, the, um, the uh, extraordinarily expensive and I suspect, you know, obviously polluting um, attempts to blast people into space and thinking about setting up colonies on Mars and so on is, is quite often set out in terms of, you know, we're trashing this planet, uh, it's only going to have a finite life for the sake of humanity we need to, to colonise. Um, well, it seems to me these sums of money could be much better spent trying to put, put right the devastation on this planet rather than thinking about how to escape from it. So uh, it, you don't have to dig very far to find ways in which astrobiological, astronomical themes are very closely tied to, um, to, to questions of the, of the degradation of the earth. Um, yeah, I mean, just to, to, just to really stress that point I was making, it was that um, if you think the second coming is gonna happen any minute, and certainly in our, you know, in our lifetime, or only in our in lifetime of our, of our race, then um, you, you're just disincentivized um, in a certain, well, at least one way of looking at it, disincentivizes you to really, to care for the earth. And um, whereas if you think that, well, that might be the case, but you know, odds are uh, if there's life elsewhere in the universe and if some have been and gone and if God treats it you know, equally intimately, then that's not what we're gonna expect. Um, then really what, what we do is what happens. If we, look, if we look after it, we look after it. And if we don't, um, then, we, then we bear the consequences. And um, yeah, that did really strike me. I'm glad it struck you too. 
Okay. Was it Interstellar? Was that the film? Interstellar. The whole uh, premise is about environmental degradation. Excellent. Any other questions? Shall I? I've got one one more then. Just if, if it's all right, shall, shall I ask that and then shall we wrap up? That? Um, I've got a final question. Robert, yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry, I had to break away. I had a, um, a, 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 a phone call. My brother is ill. Um, the other question I had was how do you uh, how do you rate the likelihood of finding um, life in the rest of the um, um, one universe to the Milky Way? Well, I've been very influenced by um, Professor Jim Tor, who's a, uh, is a strong YouTube performer and a very able biochemist. And his view is that the um, Creation of life was a, was a, was a matter of quite extraordinary, um, um, unlikely, um, um, lacking in likelihood. He sees absolutely no way that he he says that uh, the understanding of the origin of life, a biochemist has absolutely no clue, and he's really convincing. Or I find he's really convincing on the subject. So it really looks as if life is a, is a one-off, or at least. The singularity, something which God done, and isn't something which which is the result of a of a natural process. I wonder if you have any thoughts along those lines. Yeah. Well, so I would say that generally, my instinct is always to try to let science have its moment in the sun and do its work. And I'm not by nature enthusiastic about uh, jumping quickly to theological answers to scientific questions. So, uh, you know, I rule anything out, uh, but I, I approach questions of the origin of life, um, expecting there to be a natural um, natural explanation for it, uh, because I would see God as acting in all action, and, um, and you know, the, a universe that is uh, poised to bring forth life just by its very nature is no less remarkable than one in which there needs to be some kind of miracle, just as I would say the same for, um, I'd, I'd want to give the idea of a natural origin for intelligence and consciousness, for instance, you know, run for its money, rather than jumping to the idea that it's some uh, kind of uh, divine imposition. Um, so I, yeah, so I would be looking for a, a natural uh, explanation and without feeling at all threatened by that as a, as a theologian. Um, I, I'm not sure that, that biochemists have no, I, no suggestions about the origins of life. I think if anything, it's the opposite, that we, we have the embarrassment of having quite a few different uh, perspectives. There's one that's about life evolving from um, in, in rock pools to the concentration of chemicals. There's other people have uh, talked about um, hydrothermal vents and there being a, um, an iron sulfur cluster kind of origin. Uh, other people have more to do with uh, inorganic kind of dust-like beginnings. Um, so people are having ideas. Um, it's just we don't know very much what the conditions were like and um, we can get quite far in terms of uh, imagining conditions that bring forth quite a lot of the building blocks. Um, the question is just, you know, uh, how easy is it for them to assemble themselves into self-replicating sorts of forms? And I think we just, we just don't know. Um, what's changed for me is recognising that there are just an absolutely extraordinary number of places that, that where life could uh, emerge. And, you know, I look at you on YouTube, on, on Zoom, and I think, well, it's clearly not impossible, you know, you're exhibit A in that particular argument. And if there are 16, 16 billion, billion Earth-like planets, uh, you know, Earth -like planets around sun like stars, and it's not impossible, um, then, well, I'd like to talk to a st statistician about this, but it seems to me that, that you're making a very big claim, that you, ha you have to make a very specific claim if you say we're unique, because you're saying, it's not so impossible that it couldn't happen, so unlikely it's not going to happen, but neither is it so likely that it could be expected to happen more than once. And that's making a very specific claim. And I think the claim that uh, it's more open-ended and there could be more than one instance seems to me making, making a, a less big claim and therefore to be more likely, but I would need to talk to a, a statistician um, about that. It's possible that we have one extra bit of data that might in, uh, inform our thinking here, 
which is that it seems like life got going on Earth not very long after the Hedean epoch, the Hades-like epoch of, of uh, bombardments and volcanic eruptions and so on, maybe only half a billion years after that. So that might be a bit of extra data that on Earth, almost as soon as life could have survived, it emerged. Um, now, I have a colleague here, uh, John Sutherland, who's involved in the Leverhulme Centre, very eminent chemist. Um, I think he might have taught chemistry in Oxford when I was a student, actually. Um, his uh, argument is that life evolved during that period. It's, it's to do with meteoric bombardments and cyanide chemistry that you get the building blocks for life. So if John Sutherland's right, then this bit of data is far from being extraordinary that life evolved so close to that period is exactly what we'd expect. But if we don't follow his interpretation, then it might be the fact that life seems to have otherwise got, got going quite early uh, would be a, another indication of it not being um, you know, that unlikely. But uh, we, we're dealing with very, very limited data here. But of course, what's really shifted with the James Webb Space Telescope is our ability within a you know, few months to be able to detect the atmospheric spectra of other planets around other stars. And so rather than having to wait for um, you know, to visit us or, or radio broadcasts, or we, would, we previously we were looking for signs of, of advanced life, uh, we're pretty much on the cusp of being able to detect the sorts of perturbations to atmospheric balances that you would get from single, single celled life or whatever there is. Um, so which is just such an exciting time to be doing this because our capacity to look for the telltale signs of life is just about to, to take off in this really spectacular way. I would recommend Jim Tour that um, you can find his- Yeah, good, good, good to have some, uh, 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 some uh, objections uh, to- have I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps be able to ping you an email with, with some references. Thank you. A normal YouTube um, performer. I think very convincing the sheer difficulties Homochorality, for example, for one of numerous examples he wheels out. And um, um, I, I must say, I, I found it extraordinarily convincing. It really was very, very difficult to understand, very, very difficult to understand. He said, in fact, that um, origin of life theories, he said they were clueless, is the word he uses, not my word, his word. And, uh, but I found it very, very convincing. But, uh, but, but obviously, two of you, I'll ping you if I may. If I may return, uh, arrange with a ping email with some references. And Please, stuff. I look forward to that. Excellent. Thank you so much. I've got to fly again, I'm afraid, in, in a little bit. Okay, yep. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Yeah, no, and uh, an interesting response. Yeah, bringing us into some of the science, but we will have various talks on that. We're going to, we're, we're starting more with the theology, and then as the uh, project and network continues, we will eventually become more science focused. So I think there'll be lots more to discuss there. Only very slight comment. I do know that um, Augustine would have been very sympathetic with everything you were saying. And you probably know this, but he, he didn't think that God, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, he didn't think that God created life directly. He thought that God created the world with the potency for life to emerge from it. So a bit more hands off, which would kind of match up with the assumptions that you're well, I don't know whether they're assumptions, but the, the, the view that you're espousing. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I have, um, is it all right if I ask one last question, Andrew, and then we wrap up? Ask away. Um, I think I know what you'll say, but it, it just occurred to me, and particularly for people watching on, on YouTube and stuff, um, and I, I, I agree with this assumption, but you, you briefly alluded to the fact that it's sort of fitting uh, and not unreasonable to think that there'd be many incarnations um, of God the Son. Do you want to, can you, can you expand on that a little bit and, and explain why that would be the assumption that you would make? Yes, well, uh, there are more chapters on the incarnation than anything else in the book, and there are seven or something like that. So uh, I do think this is a, a very uh, deep and, uh, and rich topic. And um, the fact that you talked about fittingness, I had, I had a paper in Theology and Science, the journal, a few years ago, exploring that very idea and saying that I think in these discussions, we do well not to talk about necessity and not to talk just about possibility, but this sort of middle category, um, beloved of the scholastics, of, uh, of just saying that that which is would be fitting, um, but without 
having a certain kind of reserve or humility about knowing exactly what that would be. Um, so what I would say is I'm perfectly open to those and you know, happy with those who say that there doesn't need to be is a necessity for more than one incarnation. Uh, for me, the question would be, but does that almost feel like the, the most uh, suitable or fitting thing? And, the, and my argument for this basically is what I think of as the Star Wars analogy. So um, you might know at the beginning of Star Wars, it says something like long ago in a galaxy far, far away. And my, my thought experiment here is, what if there's life all over there in the universe, you know, of a similar level of, of uh, consciousness as us, uh, and there's only one incarnation, but the shoe was on the other foot and it wasn't with us. What if on some planet somewhere, a very, very different kind of creature had been the, the, the species that received the incarnation? Well, in that case, instead of opening Luke's gospel and reading in chapter one, in the ninth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to a virgin whose name was Mary, a spouse to a man called Joseph, and so on, and a story that is familiar to us, but it's also communicative to us, and it's a story that we can understand. What if instead I open Luke's gospel and it says, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, a thing happened that you can't possibly imagine to a creature that you can't possibly uh, you know, comprehend, and then just a, a, a story that makes no sense to us at all, because just the whole bodily basis of what's happening doesn't speak to us. Um, so again, I'd be perfectly happy to say that other incarnation that we find it very difficult to get our heads around, you know, could redeem the world, uh, could do what was to be done. Uh, it just wouldn't feel like what the incarnation has meant. Uh, just here, like say, not, not having an incarnation, but merely hearing about it in that way, wouldn't uh, feel like what the incarnation has meant to Christians, which is the idea of God intimately drawing alongside us. Um, in, and communicating to us, it's not just about communication, I think a lot more about redemption than that, but part of what's going on is this sense of the perfect communication that we get by seeing God face to face in, in, the, in the, the human uh, nature of Christ. Uh, Aquinas talks about, um, amongst other things, the incarnation being about God wanting to draw us into friendship. And he says, because things are very uh, unequal, um, and uh, incomprehensible, find it difficult to be friends. Therefore, that God could be our friend. God became um, came among us as one as, uh, that we are. If we're talking about some kind of uh, very, you know, weird octopus-like kind of creature with a life cycle that I can't understand, it doesn't seem to quite have that sense um, of God drawing us uh, into friendship and and talking to us um, as one would talk to a friend. So. It's just a kind of thought experiment. What if the shoe was on the other foot? Uh, what if we didn't have in Luke what we can understand, but long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, something incomprehensible happened? And on that basis, um, because I put this emphasis on um, the, the remarkableness of God drawing alongside us in a way that we can comprehend, that what leads me to think of multiple incarnations as being um, so fitting. But um, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Uh, you know, um, uh, I, I leave it to the divine wisdom to do that which is best um, and um, but in as much as I'm asked for an opinion of where my instincts lie that's where they lie. Yeah but also um, you'd sort of feel like like if, if you were if we're all God's children we're not his favorite because <laughs> we didn't get the incarnation <laughs> we're the one that he kind of hides in the, <laughs> in the back and in theory he loves us but not enough to in incarnate himself. <laughs> um, Good. Well, that can be a topic and, for another lecture. I'll happily talk about the incarnation on a different occasion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there will definitely be other other talks and things on that. So, yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. Excellent. Um, Jan or Stephen, do you have, you don't have to, do you have anything to add before we wrap up? Nope. nope. And I know that Stephen's, I think he's, I think he's, traveling so i think he's listening but he's not uh, not talking anyway good well thank you everybody for joining us um to those watching on youtube i'll include various links so you can learn more about andrew's work and all of that sort of thing um i think that about wraps it up um we have next week uh, next month sorry we'll have the second in our uh, reading group on uh religion and science fiction and all of that sort of stuff um but yeah, I think that that's it for the next few weeks. Um, 
Ah, yes. Okay. Yes, Stephen is there, but he can't unmute. Anyway, perfect. Okay. Well, I think that's it. So I'll say goodbye. Um, yes, I'll say goodbye. Uh, feel free to leave. And uh, yeah, yeah, talk to everybody soon. Thank you very much.